Are you prepared you? to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? Mute? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Well, hello and a very warm welcome to the show. I'm Daisy McAndrew, standing in today for Vanessa Feltz. Coming up. We're asking for £21 an hour. Is that really unreasonable for a doctor with so many skills? The longest strike in the history of the NHS is underway as thousands of junior doctors take part in a six-day walkout. It's set to push the number of appointments cancelled past the million mark. A mortgage relief for millions. Homeowners could save thousands of pounds this year as lenders kick off 2024 by slashing rates. And his sensational run at the World Darts Championship saw him storm into the final. But will teenage superstar Luke Littler lift the trophy tonight? Give us a ring on 0344 499 1000. You can text TALK to 87222 or tweet us at TALK TV. First, let's get the news headlines with Katie Pilbeam. Good afternoon. A 15-year-old boy has been arrested on suspicion of murder over the death of 16-year-old Harry Pittman. The Metropolitan Police have said the teenager was arrested on Tuesday along with an 18-year-old man who was held on suspicion of a fray. Harry Pittman was celebrating New Year's Eve with friends on Primrose Hill when he was fatally stabbed. Two blasts, two twin blasts near the Iranian general Qasim Soleimani's tomb has killed more than 100 people. According to Iran state broadcaster, over 100 people were also wounded when the blast hit a procession nearly near the Saleb al-Zaman mosque in the southern city of Kaman, where mourners were marking the fourth anniversary of his assassination. Well, this comes after Hamas deputy leader Salah al arori was killed in a Beirut blast, where an Israeli spokesperson says was a surgical strike against the Hamas leadership. Thousands of hospital appointments and operations will be cancelled over the next six days as junior doctors take part in the longest strike in the NHS's history. Well, members of the BMA in England have staged the walkout as they call for a 35% pay increase. Talks have broken down since the government pay offer was rejected in December. Well, leader of the Liberal Democrats, Sir Ed Davies, says the government's been asleep at the wheel. We understand uh, the problems that doctors are facing. The government, however, should be fixing this. That's their job. That's what they get paid for. So many parts of the NHS aren't working, whether it's getting a GP appointment, uh, waiting for ambulances, getting NHS dentists, and now the wait times for hospital operations are so big. Uh, the really government, the government should be doing something. More than 500 flood warnings are in place across England and Wales following Storm Henk. A total of 272 flood warnings have been enforced, meaning flooding is expected. People in those areas are being urged to turn off gas, water and electricity and move things upstairs. It comes as police in Gloucestershire say a man in his 50s has died after a tree fell on the car he was driving near Kemble yesterday afternoon. HSBC has become the latest lender to cut mortgage rates. The High Street Bank says its new deals will be introduced tomorrow, which includes a two-year fixed remortgage rate of 4.49% and a five-year deal of 3.94%. It comes as more banks and building societies are expected to follow suit in the coming weeks. Luke Littler is preparing to be the youngest person ever to take part in a final at the World Darts Championship. The 16-year-old will face world number one Luke Humphreys tonight. Well, these people from Luke's Darts Academy told T Talk TV why they think he's special. I reckon he could be the next Phil Taylor. And he, he, could be a lot, he, he can possibly win a lot more than what Phil Taylor has. He is only 16. 
and not many people, even when they're older, not many people are that good. He is ridiculously good. He really is a special talent and he deserves the hype he's getting. Well, good luck to him. That is the latest. Now it's time for the weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's not looking as windy today compared to yesterday thanks to Storm Henk. It's now moved away, so for today it is calmer but still quite blustery out there with a lot of wet weather to be had as well in the way of showers for most of the UK as you can see from the earlier satellite and radar but also spells of rain. In fact, rain on and off across Scotland this afternoon where it will be rather cloudy and rather blustery around coastal parts. Wind's still strong around the English Channel coastline and the Bristol Channel coastline too with gales likely and there are lots of showers as I said becoming widespread across England and Wales and a few for Northern Ireland, some heavy and thundery, particularly out towards the west. Now, overnight, the showers will tend to ease from the west, so it will become somewhat dry and clearer by dawn, and the rain will ease across Scotland too, so carrying on across the far northeast, mainly over Shetland and Orkney, but mainland Scotland becoming drier and clearer from the west, and a tad colder compared to previous nights. And then tomorrow, we've still got some wet weather around. There will be showers, mainly across parts of Northern England, Northern Ireland, and the northeast of Scotland. We'll continue to see wet and windy conditions, maybe even a little bit of snow for Shetland. Otherwise, it's looking mostly fine, but southern counties of England will see some rain later in the afternoon, which could cause some flooding issues. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. very much Katie and Nazanin right let's move to our top story the longest strike in the history of the NHS is underway as thousands of junior doctors in England take part in a six-day walkout health bosses say it's one of the most difficult starts to the year they've ever faced with almost all routine care affected junior doctors are locked in a bitter dispute with the government over pay and this action follows a breakdown in talks last month the walkout also comes at one of the busiest times of the year for the nhs with flu and winter viruses on the rise well talk tv spoke to the co-chair of the bma committee earlier today Look, if the government have another offer to make, and it's a credible offer that we can put to our members, then of course the strike action can be averted. And Victoria Atkins says she has another offer to make. So it begs the question, why didn't she make that offer before the deadline? Or why hasn't she made it in the four weeks since talks broke down when they pushed us out of the room? Joining me now to discuss this is Dr Lawrence Buckman. He's former chair of the British Medical Association's GP committee. Doctor, thank you so much for talking to us. Many people will find this strike extraordinary given, as we were just saying in the, your introduction there, given how stretched the NHS always is at this time of year, given that we've got COVID, we've got a flu ongoing, we've already had so many cancellations, waiting lists are so long. Do you understand why less, fewer and fewer people are now sympathetic to this strike? I don't expect anybody to be sympathetic to the strike. I think strike is the last thing you want. And this situation has been reached because the two sides aren't talking to each other, and I think they should. Although we know from the government saying, you know, if you call off this strike, we'll talk. And then, uh, you know, the, the um, junior doctors saying, we'll talk when you offer us um, another pay deal. The government saying we've already gone as far as we can. So it's a case of chicken and egg at the moment, isn't it? No, I don't think it is. I think uh, negotiation around pay is invariably a give and take on both sides, preferably conducted out of the public eye. And both sides are going to end up talking to each other at some point about some deal or other. So they might as well start now. And um, I know the government doesn't like talking when strike action is, is happening, but actually... That's not realistic. The, the juniors have got to be given something. Remember, junior just means not a consultant. And we know there have been settlements in Scotland and with the consultants. And so I think it is possible, Scotland for juniors and consultants for the whole of the UK. So therefore, there is no reason why somebody can't come to some sort of conclusion. And there are all sorts of offers that could be made that would resolve this problem. 
Well, you're right to say that you know junior doctors, um, some of them are not very junior at all because it goes all the way up uh, to consultant grade. And of course, some of them, yes, are on you know salaries that are as low as in the sort of 30 to 37 uh, thousand pounds a year, but an awful lot of them are on considerably more than that. You know, the average hospital doctor's salary is 87 thousand pounds a year, and I think most people think that's a pretty respectable salary. Yes, you, you, it depends what you're comparing it with. And we're particularly talking about the lower end of that pay scale. And the people on the lower end really are earning surprisingly little money for saving your life. Um, and it ought to be more. They work very hard. Many of them are very uh, upset at the way they're being treated by the NHS in general, mainly because of the, the lack of money, but also because they work very hard and they find it difficult and they're saying they'd rather go and work somewhere else. And therefore you have to pay the rate for the job. There are constructive ways you could look at the pay scales. Clearly, some of the people who are called juniors are actually very nearly consultants mm. and are on good pay. But there are an awful lot of very new juniors who are very badly paid. But again, if you look at what a junior doctor earns 10 years after graduating, uh, they average 57,000. The average salary for somebody who did a degree, who's uh, earning 10 years later, is 32,000. So even in that case, when somebody is still relatively junior, probably uh, in their early 30s, they are making £20,000 more than other graduates who left university 10 years later. It still sounds like an OK deal. Yes, of course it does. Uh, when you're comparing anyone's income with anyone's income, and you and I know that pay comparability is a very poor tool because everyone looks at what they're earning and thinks it's unreasonable and looks at everybody else and says what they're getting is reasonable. Junior doctors work very long hours in very stressful conditions where they might end up losing their customer, which is unusual in most other walks of life. Uh, and they have to do this for relatively low pay per hour. There are doctors who are more senior who do get more money, but you cannot average it out in that way and say, well, that's the same as any other kind of profession. You really can't compare one profession with another. What you're saying is that junior doctors get a good pay total average but that doesn't apply to the youngest doctors nor the hours they work which are not particularly reasonable and very stressful for them okay but what about the fact that they're asking for 35 percent i mean compared to all other unions in the cost of living crisis over the last 12 to 18 months that has been way and above the biggest demand and one of the reasons that they've said that it's that they've totted it up at 35 percent is because instead of using cpi that measure of inflation that all other unions demands have been measured on they've used rpi which makes which another form of measuring inflation which has meant that their maths has come out at this absolutely whopping 35%. Surely if they just changed that, and actually if they did uh, use CPI like everyone else did, that comes down to 16% and suddenly you find yourself in a situation where 16% isn't a million miles away from what the government's uh, offering and you could get somewhere. Mm, that's very nice, but of course RPI and CPI were interchanged by the government, not interchanged by any worker anywhere. Uh, and juniors had a, a pay deal once upon a time which was ahead of inflation very slightly and what's happened is all doctors as i predicted 20 years ago who are used as regulators along with all other state employees have had their pay reduced and reduced against inflation to the point that they're now getting below inflationary pay rises as a result they now say we are 35 percent behind now how could you deal with that? Well, you clearly can't deal with it in one go. Mm. No one is ever going to offer a 35% pay rise. So it has to be done gradually, constructively, and some of it will be moving money around within the current pay envelope. And of course, that's what you expect. That's what the consultants did. That's what the Scots uh, juniors have done. So clearly, that's where the deal has to go. It, it's never going to be a 35% pay bump. That will never happen. Indeed, that's purely restoration. That's not really a pay rise against inflation if you go back far enough. So you have to say, how can we do this? And it isn't by 
industrial action versus refusal yeah. to negotiate. But do talked about to be both sides around the table saying, how can we do this? And it will never be one big leap. It just won't happen like that. Yeah, I, th I think that's definitely something we can both agree on. Dr. Buckman, I think one of the other elements of this strike that um, has meant negotiation is even harder is the fact that the junior doctors weren't willing to keep A&Es running normally. The fact that they're continuing to rely on consultants to step in and, and cover their shifts. Consultants who at this time of year, you know, many of them um, are on holiday, uh, you know, long booked holidays. A number of them because you know, a proportion of the population is sick at this time of year. You've got more people phoning into hospitals sick. You know, it is. It seems like such a cynical time to do the biggest strike in history, a six-day strike, when they know that patients are going to suffer and possibly die. I think the decision to strike is always unfortunate, and I think uh, this is no less than any other time. There's never a good time to take industrial action, and the NHS is in crisis every single day. It isn't. This particular season, I quite agree with you, the winter is a worse time than others, but it's always a bad time. And the, the juniors have arranged to support cover. They will also come in if they must, uh, if, they're, if they're called in. And every site has agreements on at what point are juniors called in, particularly to A&E, but also to intensive care and other places. I think the consultants have taken it very well and are supporting the juniors. And that's because they know that they were in the same situation themselves before. And I hope that they can rapidly resolve this and stop uh, needing to take industrial action and that the government can come round the table and find a way of gradually uh, ad adjusting the juniors a lot. Yeah, well, I think, again, that's something we can agree on, that we all want to see uh, negotiations uh, restarted. I, I disagree with you on whether the consultants are still fully behind this, right? Certainly from those I've spoken to and, um, and I've read interviews with, a number of them are beginning to lose some of the support that they're certainly the junior doctors did have. But I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Dr Lawrence Buckman, thank you so much for talking to Talk TV uh, this afternoon. Now, coming up after the break, hundreds of flood warnings remain in place after Storm Henk battered Britain. I'm Daisy McAndrew and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? 
If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. So yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? Use? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Hello and welcome back. Now, a danger to life flood warning remains in place in parts of the country in the aftermath of Storm Henk. One person died in Gloucestershire and another is in hospital in Kent after trees fell on their cars. The storm has left some home and business owners on standby as flood risks remain high. And on the railways, disruption is expected to continue into the evening. Joining me in the studio to discuss all of this is travel expert guru Simon Calder. Um, Simon, let's deal with the weather and storm Henk at the moment. Obviously, yesterday it was really quite frightening out there and we've heard obviously one fatality um, and other injuries. How has today looked? How have the roads been? Uh, the roads are getting better. In fact, the roads probably relative to the railways were doing all right, apart, as you say, from this tragic fatality and the other problems we've seen on the roads. It's the railways where we have had just an almighty series of problems to do mostly with fallen trees and flooding. And that has been a theme not just yesterday, but today as well, with a very slow recovery from the problems yesterday, understandably, because there were an awful lot of problems. I mean, awful for commuters, uh, yeah. particularly at the big London stations. Uh, they, they were just being told, we're going to suspend all trains for a while and you're just going to have to wait until we think it's safe to run them again. And Simon, when that happens and, you know, commuters are tearing their hair out and, you know, cursing um, the rail networks, is it fair to blame somebody or do we just blame an act of God? Such a good question. And of course, uh, the, uh, you, you cannot control storms. Some will say storms are getting worse as a result of man-made climate change. The unions say, we know what's going on and it is network rail failing to invest mm. in things like drainage, in things like clearing line side vegetation. And as a result of that, uh, we are seeing all these problems. Now, um, possibly the answer lies somewhere between, but I have never seen such extreme uh, flooding so regularly. It used to be a kind of once in you know, a year or two. Now yeah. it seems to be once in a week or two. And of course, we've, we're three days into January, all of which have been miserable for thousands of travellers. And this comes after the worst December ever with strikes, schedule cuts, all kinds of problems with the Channel Tunnel and just general misery, train crew shortages, which has been a problem today, along with broken trains and, would you believe, somebody stealing signalling cable at Wakefield, which meant you couldn't get any trains from Leeds to Doncaster. How do you go about stealing cable? I don't know, but I wish they wouldn't. Yeah. Um, and it is a yeah, really serious effect. It led to train cancellations, um, lots of delays and diversions at a time when we desperately need some resilience in our service. And of course, we've got some scheduled misery coming up because we've got uh, train strikes and tube strikes here, here in London coming up. Any glimmer of hope that they might go? Well, uh, yes, just this afternoon. Let me explain what is supposed to be happening. So from uh, the afternoon of uh, Sunday, the 7th of January, right through to Thursday, the 11th, members of the RMT union working for the London Underground will be walking out. What normally happens is that basically the whole tube system closes down. Now, it's not going to affect, and this is crucial for people wanting to get to and from Heathrow Airport, not going to affect the Elizabeth Line, nor indeed the London an underground uh, overground network. Sorry to interrupt, but why doesn't it affect the Elizabeth Line? Is because that different from the... Yes, how it is. is that different All to the other these lines? things are run with their own terms and conditions. And the Elizabeth Line, is it a tube? Not really. Is it a train? Well, sort of. Um, but it's run on a separate contract 
and they don't have any dispute going on. This is all about the RMT union basically saying to uh, Sadiq Khan, mayor of London, who's responsible for transport for London, go and get some more money from the government and give it to us. And he's saying, we can't. We've been asking for years. Um, and as a result of that, this strike is planned, extremely damaging to hundreds of thousands of commuters and everybody else who wants to get around in London. These things can get called off. And indeed, just this afternoon, the RMT union has said to Transport for London, OK, if we both agree to go to ACAS, the conciliation service, then we can call off the strike now. So that might happen. But at the moment, it's still going ahead. And of course, yet more uncertainty. In terms of rail strikes, nothing on the cards at the moment. But as left, the train drivers union is going to be meeting next week. It's executive committee. And I would not be at all surprised if they called more national strikes for later in January. Now, Simon, I'm delighted you mentioned ACAS. And our younger viewers might not even know what ACAS is. But when I was a cub reporter, I spent hours standing outside that ACAS headquarters, which, as you said, was the conciliatory um, you know, bureau where the unions would get into, you know, smoke filled rooms all smoking their cigarettes and pipes and they would get together with ACAS and representatives of the government and the theory was thrash out a deal when whenever there was a strike ongoing but in this wave of strikes we've had in the last sort of two years or so ACAS is barely mentioned does it not really function anymore well it of course works if both parties want to go to it but the thing is each party particularly in the train drivers against the train operators and actually, ultimately, the government, the two sides are so far apart that neither of them wants to go to ACAS because they would have to move a long way from their existing position. Just to remind you what that is, the train drivers say, some of us haven't had a rise for five years. We want a decent, no-strings-pay increase, and then we can talk by you know, in individual companies about uh, modernization and we're going to basically sell some of our terms and conditions to you, which is what we've always done. The government, and of course, bear in mind, the taxpayer is going to be bearing the brunt of any increase, is saying, you're joking. Um, revenue uh, from tickets is down over 20%. Yes. Post-pandemic. Yeah, this is costing us billions of pounds. We can only give you a modest pay increase if you accept uh, changes to your terms and conditions. And with those two sides uh, so far apart, no point in having ACAS. And it's just, well, according to Mick Whelan, General Secretary of ASLEF, the Train Drivers Union, this could well drag on until we get a change of government, which well, you would know much more about than I do. So when I was just about to say, do you think that's actually the point, that they think sometime in 2024 we probably will have a change of government, we will probably have the Labour Party in, you know, in government, in Downing Street, they will be more susceptible and amenable to our demands, so we might as well just keep striking until then. Do you think that's what's really going on? Well, I think they are very much of the mind that we're going to keep everybody, we're going to keep reminding everybody we're here and how much power we have because the RMT union, which has more or less settled its national dispute, their strikes by the end were having much less effect than ASLEF. If ASLEF goes out, then typically 90% of all the trains across England will stop. So therefore, yes, they're going to keep saying we're here we haven't got to wait our demands remain exactly the same and it doesn't seem as though the government has uh, is particularly inclined to settle perhaps because well they have described these as quotes labor's strikes and it might well become an election issue stuck in the middle of all this misery is the poor old yeah. passenger who is looking at his or her watch thinking where's my train and maybe i should just buy a car or maybe i should just work from home Yes. And that's a whole yes. nother story, which we haven't got time to get. Simon Calder, uh, thank you very much. So not much good news for rail passengers, but potentially some good news for Londoners who Possibly. go on, on the tube. Simon, thank you. All right, well, moving on now to the post office scandal. Now, that has been brought back to our attention as a new ITV drama all about the many sub postmasters wrongfully prosecuted of theft and fraud hits our screens. Well, those involved in the scandal are calling on the former post office chief, Paula Venels, to hand back her CBE. Joining us now is Jeanette Skinner. Jeanette wrongly spent nine months in jail, finally had her conviction overturned in 2020. Jeanette, thank you so much um, for talking to us here on Talk TV this afternoon. That's OK. Sorry, my name's Janet, not Jeanette. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> thank you for correcting so me. Um, 
Janet, just explain how you ended up uh, going to prison, what it was you were accused of. So my office was um, had a loss of £59,000, um, which couldn't be um, explained. There was no explanation. Um, there was no evidence of theft, um, but they prosecuted, to, well, gave me a prosecution of um, false counting and theft. But then on the day that I went to court in the magistrate's court, they offered me a plea bargain. So they said if um, I pleaded guilty to the false accounting, they would drop the theft, um, which is what I did, um, basically to prevent myself from going to prison. And that was because you're a mother and you were understandably worried about the effect of you being uh, in prison would have on your children, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, I had two teenage kids and you're supposed to set an example. And what kind of example was I setting going to prison? Um, so I wanted to avoid prison at all costs. Um, so I just took the plea bargain. Um, but I was, um, fortunately, I was sent to prison anywhere. And Janet, explain to our viewers, some of whom might not be that familiar with the story, a lot um, will be, and of course more so because of the ITV um, drama, but explain the scale of what happened to postmasters like yourself and the fact that at the time you didn't know that there were so many other people in the same situation being accused of things that they absolutely hadn't done. Well, this is the thing. I mean, I didn't actually find out anything more about it until about 2011, 2012. I just sort of, like, buried it. Um, but because you're made to believe that there's only you having these problems, you just automatically think, well, it must be something I'd done wrong. Um, but, um, yeah, it was... It, the scale of it is huge. It's not just hundreds of people. It's affected thousands of people and it's been an ongoing thing since since it was rolled out in 2000. And this is people, so basically there was a computer system that didn't work and the postmasters, it looked like you were fiddling the books, it looked like um, you were thieving from the post office because the computers were saying that there was money missing when actually there wasn't money missing. And my understanding is hundreds of people uh, were convicted, but also shunned from their local communities for being you know, fraudulent and for, for, for thieving. Um, you know, family breakdowns, people died without clearing their names. And this was a huge scandal. It is a huge scandal and the drama will help people get a better understanding of actually what we've been up against for years. Um, I mean, this is obviously been going on for over two decades, um, but the fight has been, we, we've been continuously fighting behind the scenes. Um, and for the, for the drama now, although I'm not characterised within it, I'm part of everything that goes on in that process of the drama. Um, but I mean, for the drama itself, it was impossible for them to um, ca cast a character of 555 people um, so they, you know, they have they've had to break it down, um, and I think they've done a really, really good job in the way that they've brought the story out, and the way that now the it's actually now getting the media attention that it so rightly deserves. I mean, it is actually the biggest miscarriage of just justice in legal history. And not everybody has had the compensation. I know that's one big issue. But another issue that people have been talking about today, Janet, um, is whether the former boss of the post office, uh, Paula Venels, should hand back her CBE. My understanding is that um, the Mr Bates um, of the, the eponymous uh, Mr Bates um, of the TV drama actually was offered a CBE and turned it down. Um, and one of the reasons he said that is because you know, he felt he's been very badly treated by the state and by the establishment, that there's been a political cover-up, um, or certainly politicians um, haven't been held accountable, and also the bosses of the post office and the Royal Mail haven't been held accountable. Would you agree with that? Well, nobody's been held accountable. Um, I contacted the peerage in... Um, ..CBE back in 2021. Um, and I just uh, um, received an email back saying it's not actually something they can do. 
So, I mean, now I think they're calling on the ministers and, and MPs to actually have that CB removed. She's watched people's lives being destroyed in front of her and she's done nothing about it. And it's like she stated herself clearly in 2015, I am the CEO and the book stops with me. Well, if the book stops with her, hand your CBE back. Well, I'm sure that that is a sentiment that many of our uh, viewers this afternoon would agree with. Um, and I would urge everybody to watch the drama. You can find it um, on ITV or ITVX. Uh, Janet, thank you so much. Um, and I do hope that um, this year perhaps will bring not only your um, fellow postmasters the compensation they need, but some answers perhaps from the establishment. Some closure. Some closure, exactly. Amen to that. Thank you very much, Janet. Thank you. Now coming up after the break, homeowners rejoice. Tumbling mortgage rates could save you hundreds of pounds a month. I'm Daisy McAndrew, you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on the <laughs> <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. Now, it might be good news for homeowners as lenders, including the Leeds Building Society and the Halifax, kick off 2024 with significant mortgage rate cuts. Some deals have fallen by as much as 1%, potentially saving thousands of pounds for those with expiring fixed rate deals. Joining me live is the mortgage advisor, Sally Mitchell, also known as the Mortgage Mum. Sally, very good to have you on. My pleasure. Um, 
Sally, the reason I said it sounds like good news is obviously anybody's mortgage coming down, anybody having to pay less is good news for them. But I just wonder what it means for the general market and why it's happening. Well, the um, the easy way to answer that really is to talk about swap rates, which you know is not really tea time subject, <laughs> but it's um, it's something that the um, mortgage lenders use to judge how they should price their own products. And we've seen swap rates coming down for the last few months. And in fact, they've been coming down even over Christmas. And that shows the mortgage lenders, they think that there are brighter times ahead and that maybe um, a base rate cut is on the horizon. And so the lenders feel confident that they can actually offer more um, affordable rates, shall we say. It is worth pointing out that although the rates are coming down, which is great news for the 1.6 million people who are remortgaging off low rates this year, that's an awful lot of people, they will still be looking at rates 2 or 3% potentially above what they fixed at two years ago. So yes, it's better, but for those people who are remortgaging, from fixed products, they're still going to have quite a shock in their pocket every month, unfortunately. Yeah, so Sally, I suppose we could describe it as a very small silver lining rather than, hooray, the housing market, the mortgage market yeah. is, is getting so much better. And and yeah. generally speaking, again, I my understanding was one of the reasons why banks were putting their rates down is because... Or, and, um, uh, building societies is because they weren't shifting many mortgages they weren't hitting their own targets which again might show that the market um, isn't in a great place yeah i mean it's certainly true that they have targets they have money that they have to lend you know that is their their job is to lend money otherwise they don't make any money um and the market has been i wouldn't say depressed but it has been suppressed in the last six months or so and you know, no wonder when rates were going you know, six, seven, seven and a half percent, unless you really had to, who wanted to commit to a mortgage rate of that? Mm. What we have seen in the last month or so in the lead up to Christmas, which was very strange, um, is a returning confidence in purchasing. So people who have held off, people who have thought, no, not now, not at the moment, I'll just wait and see, appear to be thinking, OK, if not now when you know things are going in the right direction and the lenders can really encourage that sort of growth in the market by offering these rates it's funny um everyone has sort of followed suit we thought there would be a bit of um a bonanza shall we say this month but it's come a few days early i'm surprised that it's happened this side of the weekend i expected the announcements to be next week um, and i hope that it does give people confidence to you know to gosh, get on with their lives and, 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 you know, take that leap if they can, because it's been a really difficult year for most mortgage holders and prospective buyers. And Sally, we've only got a few more seconds, um, but anybody who either has to move uh, their mortgage, because as you said, they're coming to the end of their, their fixed term, or people who are thinking, maybe it's time for me to move, maybe it's time for me to remortgage, what's the best advice at the moment? Oh, um, don't bury your head in the sand. I always say this, get some advice from a, from a reputable mortgage broker. Recommendations are the best. Um, and start looking at your options at least six months ahead of time. That way you can lock in a rate if you're remortgaging, you can do that six months ahead of time. And then knowing you can change it if things improve, if there are better rates out there in, in the period. Um, and if things do go slightly awry, which we have seen, then at least you know you've got something in your back pocket and it's not the worst case scenario. So preparation is key. OK, well, I think always that advice, don't stick your head in the sand, is very, valu <laughs> very valuable advice. <laughs> Sally Mitchell, thank you very much. We are now moving on because the government has announced a side hustle tax clampdown. Now, this is about the online platforms, places like eBay, Airbnb, Amazon. They must now share seller information with Her Majesty's, His Majesty's Revenue and Customs. The measure aims to combat tax evasion by those earning from second-hand goods or renting out spare rooms. Joining me in the studio to discuss this is Laura Souter, Director of Personal Finance at AJ Bell. Um, Laura, thank you so much for coming to see us. 
as somebody who buys an awful lot on eBay and Vinted and places like that, I haven't really dipped my toe into selling yet, but I have a, a lot of friends who sell a lot. Are they going to be affected by this? Are you suddenly going to have to do you know, a tax return because you're selling a few old clothes on eBay? Or is that not the type of person this is aimed at? So I think what's really important to say is while the rules change, the tax rules haven't changed. And so this will only catch out people who either weren't declaring this income before or weren't aware that they had to because, as we know, tax is very complicated and it's often hard to work out whether you owe it or not. But essentially, there's a £1,000 limit and that's what people need to be aware of. So you can make a £1,000 of trading income. So that is what we would probably now call side hustle income. So income outside of your main job, whether that's selling things on Vinted or eBay, whether that's renting out your driveway, for example, or for maybe teenagers doing babysitting work on the side, you can earn that £1,000 each tax year before you have to declare it to the tax man and before you have to pay tax on it. So that's the crucial threshold. If you're under that, then you're, you shouldn't need to fill out a self-assessment tax return or pay any tax on that money. If you're over that, then you need to ask some questions. So this is, as we said in the introduction, people who might be renting out a room on Airbnb, but not you know, re not as their main source of income or, or not regularly. People who sell a bit on you know, eBay and Vinted and those places. But the difference now is that, in, a, in effect, those platforms are going to be responsible for sort of dobbing in the people selling selling on their platforms. That sounds like quite a headache for them to have to do. Yeah, so it's a big administrative burden for these platforms that until now haven't really had to provide it. Airbnb previously has actually had some of this link up with the tax man. So we've seen a bit there where um, HMRC really wanted to crack down on those people making large income from Airbnb. So we've had a bit of it from there. But yeah, from the other companies, it's now setting up that information, handing over the details to HMRC that they, so that HMRC can link it up with individuals' tax accounts um, and then send that dreaded brown letter if people haven't been paying their tax. And do you think this is a sensible move? Because it's, I mean, obviously, if you're if you're getting more than a thousand pounds income or profit uh, a year, then that is a significant amount. It's not an income as such. Mm. And so I think, it's interesting how the tax man has kind of framed this. I think in reality, what they're going to be first looking at is those people making huge sums of money off this. And there will be people who generate a big income and a big, it may be their only source of income um, through some of these platforms. And so that is probably what the tax man is going to have their eyes on first, because that's where the bigger wins are for them in terms of the unpaid tax. Um, people like me, who I think probably made about £150 on Vinted last year, I'm not sure I'm going to be their first port of call. And obviously, I'd be within the rules anyway but so I think Pete is a good reminder to people that there are tax rules there and that people might have fallen foul of them and they need to be aware of them and I suppose in many ways you know, people talk about the gig economy and all these types of and also particularly you know, younger generations um, or in the workforce tending to have multiple sources of income multiple careers on the go it's you know, long gone um, have been the, the days of, of my sort of grandfather who that generation would have one job and that was their job for life you know now people are doing lots of different things they might be selling a bit on vintage they might be you know driving an uber uh, they might have a day job as well that's much more common but it's complicated for the tax man exactly and it's complicated for individuals because it's far easier to just be employed by a company who then pay you through paye they sort out your tax your national insurance and you just have that one job but yeah if you've got multiple jobs and multiple employments as well as multiple side hustles it gets quite complicated for individuals to work out now there is a lot of help on the gov.uk website so it's not necessarily a case that you need to go out and pay for an accountant although if you have more complicated cases that might be worthwhile yeah, but, it, but it is a good reminder that actually you need to add together everything that you're earning from all of these different jobs not just look at them in isolation and don't leave it to the end of the tax year thank you very very much and don't get in a panic at the end <laughs> of march uh, now coming up after the break the countdown is on until teenage dart sensation luke littler battles it out for the world championship trophy i'm daisy kandri you're with talk on tv radio online and on your smart speaker Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? 
we do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back. Now, in just a few hours' time, teenage dart sensation Luke Littler, not this one, that's our own baby-faced Luke, uh, Littler is going to step out onto the stage at Alexander Palace knowing he's just one win away from immortality. 16-year-olds defied all the odds to make the world final and if he wins, will become the youngest world champion in history. And here at Talk TV, we've been getting into the spirit ourselves. Oh, 180! That is... Our very own 180. Now that's quite enough of that. Back to work. Luke, he is called Luke. Now standing in Littler's way is the number three seed, another Luke, Humphreys. But it's not their first meeting. Here they are at local pub competition when Littler was just 12 years old. Now some people have disputed the teenager's age, but Talk TV has got concrete evidence. Here is his actual birth certificate showing he is just 16. Well, Luke's been preparing with tonight's final with his hearty diet of ham and cheese omelettes, pizza and kebabs. Talk TV correspondent Nick Ellerby has been to his favourite takeaway, who've named a meal after him. Good afternoon, Daisy. If, and it's a big if, but if Luke Littler wins the PDC World Championship darts tonight, I'm sure there'll be a lot more trips to this place. We're outside Hotspot Kebab Shop in Warrington. This is, I have it on very good authority, Luke the Nuke Littler's favourite kebab shop and, and the one he likes to celebrate with is the kebab wrap. So we're talking donna meat, bit of salad and mayonnaise as well. Not the usual garlic and chilli sauce but actually with mayonnaise. At this place, hotspot in the centre of Warrington, the kebabs are only £4. So if he does win, that half million pound jackpot can get him 125,000 kebabs. <laughs> he could have three a day for the next hundred years, so he will be well sorted. Uh, you know, we'll make light of it, but 
fast food is a, is a big part of Luke's preparation. We know that for breakfast every day at the Ali Pali before each match, he's having a ham and cheese omelette at home. And then he goes in, has a quick practice for enjoying a pizza at the Ali Pali before he goes on stage. And he's doing the same today, but it's the kebab he likes to celebrate with. But, you know, we've been in Warrington and St. Helens for the last couple of days, and, and he really is the talk of the town, Luke Littler, just 16 years old, an unbelievable talent, and, and the composure he's showing as well. If he can become world champion at the age of 16, it'll beat the record by eight years. And I think it really will be probably the biggest sports story since Leicester won the Premier League. And what do we know about Luke? Well, he's a pretty normal teenager. He likes to play FIFA, a video game. He likes to play a bit of darts and he likes his food as well. And his friends tell me he, likes, he quite likes sleeping. We know he has a French bulldog. Um, so we're kind of building up a bit of a better picture of, of who the man is. But, but, you know, this kid, I say man, he looks like a man, but he's still, he's still a boy, isn't he? Still a kid. He, he turned 17 at the end of this month, but um, everybody around here, Warrington, St. Helens, is rooting for him. And it's quite interesting because around here you've got a lot of different factions of rugby league teams. So, you know, you've got Warrington, St. Helens, Widnes. And what's happened is, is that Luke has united all these competitive clans. Uh, we were at a darts night last night, a, a league match between a pub called the Windle in St. Helens that uh, Luke has played for in the past and a local sports club, FC St. Helens. And everybody was just, you know, they were playing their matches, but they had one eye on the, the semi-final as well. And, and the word I keep hearing when I speak to people is unbelievable. It's unbelievable what he's managed to achieve at such a young age. And the way he's, he's also, he doesn't look 16. He's, he's playing the crowd. He's, he's using different techniques and incredible different checkouts as well. And, and making guys twice his age look, look silly, really. So, you know, should he win tonight, we know he'll be celebrating with a kebab down in London. And when he gets back to Warrington in the bosom of his, his family and friends, I'm sure he'll be uh, making his way down to Hotspot here in the High Street. I'm sure he will be. Thank you very, very much, Nick Ellaby, reporting live from Luke Littler's hometown of Warrington. What a fairy tale. And you can listen to full coverage of the PDC World Darts final from Alexander Palace from 7 o'clock tonight on Talk Sport. Coming up after the break, Richard Tice piles pressure on Rishi Sunak to call a general election sooner rather than later. I'm Daisy McAndrew. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and the smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. 
Sunak and the current Conservative government are not Conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, Mm. Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Well, hello and welcome back to the show. I'm Daisy McAndrew. Here's what's coming up this hour. You've all broken Britain. You're all responsible. So there's no special deals. We stand in every single seat in England, Scotland and Wales. Well, fighting talk. Richard Tice kicks off Reform UK's election campaign with a scathing attack on the Tory party's failures and warns a Starmer-led government would be a disaster. It's battle of the sexes. Female artists are dominating the charts, spending more time at number one than men for the first time ever. And his sensational run at the World Darts Championship saw him storm into the final. Will teenage superstar Luke Littler lift the trophy tonight? Give us a ring on 0344 499 1000. Text TALK on 87222. Or you can tweet us at TALK TV. But first, let's get the news headlines with Katie Pilbeam. Thank you, Daisy. Good afternoon. A 15-year-old boy has been arrested on suspicion of murder over the death of 16-year-old Harry Pittman. The Metropolitan Police have said the teenager was arrested on Tuesday, along with an 18-year-old man who was held on suspicion of a fray. Harry Pittman was celebrating New Year's Eve with friends on Primrose Hill when he was fatally stabbed. Thousands of hospital appointments and operations will be cancelled over the next six days as junior doctors take part in the longest strike in the NHS's history. Members of the BMA in England have staged the walkout as they call for a 35% pay increase. Talks have broken down since a government pay offer was rejected in December. The leader of the Liberal Democrats, Sir Ed Davey, says the government's been asleep at the wheel. We understand uh, the problems that doctors are facing. The government, however, should be fixing this. That's their job, that's what they get paid for. So many parts of the NHS aren't working, whether it's getting a GP appointment, uh, waiting for ambulances, getting NHS dentists, and now the wait times for hospital operations are so big. Uh, the really government, the government should be doing something. More than 500 flood warnings are in place across England and Wales following Storm Henk. A total of 272 flood warnings have been enforced, meaning flooding is expected. People in those areas are being urged to turn off gas, water and electricity and move things upstairs. It comes as police in Gloucestershire say a man in his 50s has died after a tree fell on the car he was driving near Kemble yesterday afternoon. At least 100 people have been killed and hundreds more injured following twin explosions at a ceremony in Iran. No one has claimed responsibility for today's attack in the city of Kerman, but officials claim that terrorists are behind it. Now, this comes after Hamas deputy leader Salah al arouri was killed in Beirut in a blast there, which an Israeli spokesperson says was a surgical strike against the Hamas leadership. 
And HSBC has become the latest lender to cut mortgage rates. The High Street Bank says its new deals will be introduced tomorrow, which include a two-year fixed remortgage rate of 4.49% and a five-year deal of 3.94%. It comes as more banks and building societies are expected to follow suit in the coming weeks. Luke Littler is preparing to be the youngest person to take part in a final at the World Darts Championship. The 16-year-old will face world number one Luke Humphreys tonight. Well, these people from Luke's Darts Academy told Talk TV why they think he is so special. I reckon he could be the next Phil Taylor. And he, he could be a lot, he could, he could possibly win a lot more than, than what Phil Taylor does. He is only 16. And not many people, even when they're older, not many people are that good. He is ridiculously good. He really is a special talent and he deserves the hype he's getting. OK, that's the latest. It is now time for the weather with Nazanin Gaffer. OK, let's maybe get back to Daisy now in the studio. Well, thank you, Katie and Naz. Let's move on to our top story now. Breaking news this afternoon. This is that the UK stats watchdog has launched an investigation into the government's claim it cleared the legacy backlog of asylum claims in 2023. Well, Rishi Sunak yesterday insisted the applications made before the 28th of June 2022 had been dealt with, but 4,537 claims from the backlog still needed a decision. Joining me in the studio now is Talk TV political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald and Scarlett Maguire from JL Partners Polls. A very warm welcome to both of you. So this time yesterday, we were talking about Rishi Sunak was saying a sort of hooray for me, look how clever I've been. I promised that I was going to um, get rid of this backlog of as um, asylum claimants by the end of the year, got to January the 2nd yesterday, and he said he'd pretty much done it, give or take a few asylum claims here and there. Alicia, what are we now being told? So we're now being told that actually when you really dig down into those statistics, that isn't really the case whatsoever. There were some migrants who claimed, tried to claim asylum, but they have been escalated into a complex queue. That is people who are saying that they are under the age of 18 and whose ages need verification, people with potential criminal records and just those complex cases that just need some more time to be reviewed. That is where that 4,500-ish figure comes into. So that many people have not been reviewed or settled whatsoever. They've neither been rejected nor accepted for asylum here. The other issue is, of course, that so many people who were rejected for asylum will also be seeking appeal in the future. Lots of them who've been told no will escalate this to the courts and look for a second decision to be made. So actually, when Rishi Sunak said that he would, he had cleared all of these cases and all the backlog, that wasn't entirely transparent. And today we're hearing that a watchdog is actually investigating this claim to see whether or not it was transparent or not. I'm not entirely sure why we need a watchdog because it quite clearly wasn't entirely the case, but that, that's what's yeah. happening. They're escalating it a bit further. Now, this time yesterday, you know, I, I'm not saying I told you so, but there were many people yesterday saying this just feels a bit convenient that suddenly you have managed to get these uh, claimants all sorted. But, Scarlett, the wider picture um, here is how much does it matter how Rishi Sunak looks to be doing when it comes to asylum? Obviously, he has said that this is one of his five top pledges, but as far as the public is concerned, as far as polls are concerned, how important uh, is immigration, asylum claimants, Rwanda, all of that? Yeah, so immigration as a whole is actually hugely important to the electorate, and increasingly so. So, you know, it's in the sort of top three of the mm. most important issues facing the country for most voters. For Conservative 2019 voters, it's actually the most important issue, which explains a lot of the government strategy. I think when you move on from that, what people really care about is um, the sort of illegal migration system, especially the sort of small boats crossings. So that's where Rishi Sunak at the beginning of last year probably made the, had the right idea in saying that he was going to stop the boats and that that's what people care about. Now, it did seem a bit silly to say he was promised, you know, he was going to promise to not uh, let any more boats come to stop them completely, because I think now that's what people are measuring him against. People aren't actually, I don't think they care that much about whether the government met its own sort of quite arbitrary deadline of clearing the um, backlog before June in 2022. Don't think that matters that much to the public. What they want to see is actual action, and that's not what they're seeing, whatever the statistics watchdog says. Now, traditionally, um, when we've looked at polls and when uh, you know, pollsters have asked um, the, the public, 
Which party uh, out of Conservatives and Labour do you think is more competent on X, Y, Z? Traditionally, the Conservatives have come up better when people have been said they, they do better with crime, they do better with the economy, they do better with immigration. The latest polls I've seen haven't been saying that, which to you know, people who've been around a while was quite a shock to me. Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's been, um, I think there's actually been a degree of complacency with this Conservative government because I think they look at Keir Starmer and they think, well, he's not a very popular leader, um, so we've got room to improve. Those polls are going to narrow. But actually, when you dig into it, yes, Keir Starmer might not be very popular, but he is more trusted on every major issue. And significantly, you're absolutely right on those issues which historically the, um, the public have been, you know, a fair bit more distrustful on over Labour. But he has a clear lead on the immigration and also on economy. I find that fascinating, Alicia, that Keir Starmer and the Labour Party could have a clear lead um, when it comes not just with Labour voters, but with yeah. the electorate as a whole on those really traditional Tory core issues. Absolutely. And Scarlett's exactly right in explaining that. These are two things that were so traditional. They were seen as like the roots of the Conservative Party, if you like. And if you'd, let's go back to 10 years ago, say, if people had asked the public the same question, it would have been absolutely never would have happened for people to say that they really trusted the Labour Party with the economy or trusted them with migration. But as Scarlett said, the Conservative Party have been totally complacent with this and they're seeing that just slowly slip away and public trust has just wavered and wavered slowly just because of the track record. So Scarlett, those are issues that the Tories have normally had sort of buttoned up you know, in, in their corner. The, the issues that the Labour Party has normally been able to fall back on on polls that people think they are better at. Um, was always, the NHS was always one of them. The environment was probably one of those. Is that still the same now? Yeah, absolutely. And they have a clear lead on NHS and other public services too. I believe they do on crime. In fact, I think the only area that the Conservatives still have an edge on is defence, which is you know, um, potentially relevant if you have uh, conflicts in the Middle East ongoing, war with Ukraine and Russia. But I think you're in pretty dire straits in number 10 if you're hoping for sort of dramatic movements mm. on that uh, sort of outside of the country to leverage um, support here. And, and obviously, we know there will be an election at some point this year. I mean, literally, it could be at the beginning of next year, but it sounds like Rishi Sunak has said, yes, there will be an election this year. We know there'll be a by-election, at least one, maybe two, um, in the next few weeks, potentially. We know that there'll be local elections in May. Where are you seeing the polls going at the moment? Yeah, so I think when you're 20 points behind in the polls and have been steadily for a year, there's no good time to call an election, which I'm sure is something they'll be grappling with at the moment. I think that by-election, we don't have a date yet, but that Wellingborough by-election will be fascinating, especially because we had reform uh, that speech today from Richard Tice, and we've seen them creep up in the polls, and I think Wellingborough by-election will be a really good test of just how much damage they might do to Rishi Sunak at a general election. Uh, I think, you know, that there are arguments I've heard pushing it for May, saying, well, you know, you don't want another damaging results of local elections, might as well get on with it. I think the biggest argument uh, against that, which seems to be one of the few cards the Conservatives may have left, and it's not a guarantee, is that the economy might recover and people might give them credit for it. Now, that's two big ifs. I don't think either of those are guaranteed. Uh, but that, I think, would point to more an autumn election. Yeah, well, Scarlett has just mentioned Richard Tice. Um, and talking of him, uh, he kicked off Reform UK's election campaign today, but ruled out entering into any sort of political pact with what he's describing as the terrified Tories. Rishi Sunak is facing increasing pressure to call a general election, as we were just discussing. And Richard Tice, the leader of the Nigel Farage-linked party, says voters want to go to the polls sooner rather than later. He also hit out at Keir Starmer, saying a Labour victory would be a disaster for Britain. I'm optimistic that the country, quite rightly, wants to punish the Tories for breaking Britain, because that is what they want to do. I think the country wants to punish them, to oust them and replace them. The question is what we replace them with. Now, three years ago, when I launched Reform UK, the Tories laughed at me. They said, why are you bothering? We're getting it sorted. And to coin an expression from my good friend Nigel in the European Parliament, they're not laughing now. Well, they're not laughing now. Alicia, do you think reform might have the last laugh or does this all depend on what his good friend Nigel does? Well, it's really interesting. So reform only recently said that they would, in fact, be standing in every single seat across the country. And the Conservatives all got a bit nervous at this because they had really hoped that in the Conservative safe seats, for example, reform would actually take a step back and just let them 
hopefully take the win. That isn't the case, and the Conservatives are now really worried that what they're going to do is take some of the vote share from the Conservatives and let Labour really slide in and actually win there. The other thing in there is obviously Nigel Farage. He's obviously kind of surged back into popularity, mm -hmm. not just because of his I'm a celebrity appearance, but just because he's really stepping back into politics. He's a very Marmite character, love him, hate him, but he does appeal to a very, very specific audience in the UK. And lots of members of the Reform Party really want him back as their leader, really. And Lee Anderson, he's the Deputy Conservative Party chairman, he said this morning that he was praising Nigel Farage and he was saying that he hopes that Nigel actually does become the leader of Reform. So Reform are a big threat to the Conservative Party more than anything else here. But this is the same Lee Anderson that said that he had been offered oodles of money to defect from the Conservatives to reform, so slightly mixed messages. But Scarlett, help us understand what's going here. Uh, not long ago, people, a lot of people were writing off the Reform Party and saying that they weren't going to be big players in the next general election. It was pretty much a two-horse race uh, between Labour and Conservatives. That doesn't seem to be the case. What are you predicting on um, how well or badly reform will do? Yeah, so I mentioned sort of earlier on that the polls have been fairly steady with a 20-point Labour lead. I actually think the most interesting thing that has been happening in the polls has been that uptick in support for reform. So we did see they were really struggling with name recognition as much as anything else, and Richard Tice especially, people just hadn't heard of him, um, potentially quite bland, but, you know, people, people hadn't heard of him and weren't really sure they liked him if they had. Um, and so what we saw, though, I think, is that even on their low performance, which we saw single digits for most of this year, last year, rather, um, they could still cause a huge amount of damage. So we had that Tamworth by election where reform took enough votes off the Conservatives to uh, let Labour win the seat. So the amount Labour won by was less than the amount of votes reform got. So that shows that even when they're underperforming, they can still pose a huge damage. But crucially, we've actually seen them double their vote share in the last year. And now Rishi Sunak is losing, um, for every vote he loses to Labour from the Conservative 2019 base, he's also losing one to reform. And now the Labour one is flatlining somewhat, but that reform line is ticking upwards. And so it'll be interesting to see how far that could go. Well, yes, exactly. Exactly, because explain to us what that actually means when it comes to a system that's first past the post, a system you know, of constituencies up and down the country. It's not going to necessarily translate into members of parliament being returned to the Commons for the Reform Party. So is it what Alicia was saying, that the Conservatives will end up losing more seats the better reform does? Yeah, absolutely. I think you could see a scenario in which actually, you know, a good reform uh, performance even works very well for the Lib Dems, for example. So in those seats where the Lib Dems are second, if reform stand and take enough votes, you could see that. With Lib Dems don't actually have that much of a headline voting intention presence, not like you'd expect anyway, but it could hugely benefit those parties which are second. And you're absolutely right. I think it's quite unlikely reform will win any MPs, but they can still inflict a huge they, amount of damage. They, they certainly can. Well, we all know how much uh, the Lib Dems uh, love their gimmicks. And today it wasn't just reform kicking off their election campaign. The Lib Dem leader, Sir Ed Davey, was out and about pledging to target the blue wall. 2024, the year the voters finally get to pack up this awful, out-of-touch Conservative government throw their disastrous policies into the skip, clean up the sleaze stains from the carpet and eventually move the whole lot out of number 10. Now, that was all about the fact that he's been renaming himself the Tory removal unit, making it out that the Lib Dems are some sort of removal men that come in to get rid of you know, the squatters, as in uh, the Conservatives. It's interesting, Alyssa, isn't it, what... Uh, and you can see Ed Davey there's removal man poster. Alyssa, it's interesting what Scarlett was saying about how reform doing well might benefit the Lib Dems. That seems difficult to get your head around. Definitely. With the, in any seat where the Conservatives have a really small lead, or even so, they're just kind of neck and neck with someone else, if reform takes some of those votes, who otherwise the people would be voting for the Conservative Party, that will leave a clear win for who's ever, whoever's in that joint or second place. So reform, although, as you say, they probably won't get really any MPs in Parliament. I don't want to predict that too much. They may do, but at the moment it's not looking like it will translate into 
into seats, we could see a bit of a rise from, from people from reform and from, from the Liberal Democrats as a result of reform's existence. This is a, this, you know, I think this is the first Ed Davey gimmick that people have actually found pretty funny. It's very clever because the messaging there is quite clear. It's that the Liberal Democrats know they're probably not going to be in number 10 at the next election. They know that it is really a Labour versus Conservative fight. But what their role is and what they do have the power to do is take some seats away from the Conservative Party. And Scarlett, of course, 2019 election was billed as the get Brexit done election. Many people thought that it would be the election that would put Brexit behind us one way or another, given the outcome. But actually, now that we're seeing reform on the rise and potentially the Lib Dems on the rise, both of those, you could argue, are kind of Brexity votes, either anti or, or pro. And it slightly feels like, oh, God, are we back there again, where an election could be about bemoaning Brexit or saying we haven't done Brexit properly? I think it's probably unlikely that Brexit will become a very salient issue at the next election. However, I do think Brexit, at least in part, was a proxy for immigration, and we can see reform squarely, and Nigel mm. Farage especially comes back trying to make that the sort of central issue on which they criticise the Conservatives. Uh, and in that case, I think you could see potentially echoes of the 2019 election. I do think it's actually worth bearing in mind that Lib Dems underperformed in 2019, and I think one thing that's not commented on enough at the moment is they're actually on about the same vote share now in national intention. So, you know, you see lots of people saying that um, oh, the Lib Dems are going to win absolutely loads of seats. I don't think that's a guarantee. They're on about what they were in 2019, and that only returned them 11 seats. So I think there's a big question mark there under just how much well they could do. And, Alicia, obviously many people saying, is Nigel Farage going to come back? He wasn't there with Richard Tice today. Richard Tice did refer to him as you know, his, his great buddy. Nigel Farage seems to be you know, keeping us all guessing. What's your best guess? Well, there's been so much speculation about Nigel's big return. We'll remember just a couple of months ago, or maybe it was even a few weeks, I fully, <laughs> it all blurs into one, but there was this talk about a Nigel and Boris Johnson maybe big return. I think that is probably off the cards. But what Nigel didn't rule out today was necessarily really making a big return in the Reform Party. He said he doesn't want to go back to being leader. He's made that pretty clear. Whether we know whether that will stand and whether that will last throughout the first few months of the year, we don't know. Obviously, anything can change. But he has hinted that maybe that he will have a really key role in the electioneering, in the campaigning of reform. Yeah. He's currently their president, so he is a big figure there. But maybe he'll just be the face of it a bit more than Richard Tice, who is their current leader. All right, I'm going to be unkind and tell you both, ask you both to tell me when the election will be, the general election. My hunch is autumn, but I wouldn't want to make a certain prediction. I agree. I think lots of people want it to be May, but I just think Rishi Sunak is a very proud man. And I think by calling it early in May, yeah. he would hint that maybe things aren't going quite the way he wants them to go. Yes, uh, well, I suspect many people, both of you included, um, whose uh, lives depend on politics or careers depend on politics, going to have quite a tricky year, <laughs> year this year. Never knowing whether to book a holiday, never knowing whether you can go away, never knowing, God, what if, what I think if. think summer's safe, you know. In fact, all this is probably <laughs> safe. Yes, maybe don't book anything for May or September or October or November. <laughs> OK, um, ladies, thank you very much. All right, now coming up after the break, a row breaks out in a Wiltshire town over a controversial road name. Yes, you can see it on your screen now. I'm Daisy McAndrew and you're with Talk On TV, Radio Online and The Smart Speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. 
Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Just a couple of hours' time, teenage dance sensation Luke Littler will compete in his first World Championship final. In the last few minutes, he's been speaking to our colleagues at Talk Sport. Let's have a little listen to say, see what he said. It's been crazy. Of my Twitter slash X, of followers gone up, the views have gone up. My Instagram have gone shot out the window, and have even had messages off David Beckham, Romeo. Luke you, Shaw. You got a message from Bex? Shark yeah. zero. What did, <laughs> what did Bex say? Was it a DM from Bex? Uh, I don't. I think he said, well done, once a red, always a red. Amazing. And then Romeo's there tonight. He said, good luck. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Crazy. Do you realise the effect you're having on people? Because we spoke about it off air when you weren't obviously here and I wasn't a big darts fan before yeah. this tournament, but you've made me get into <laughs> darts. Do, like, do you understand like, obviously the impact you're having yeah. on people? And the sporting world. It's unbelievable. Like, even on Facebook, Instagram and TikTok, there's just so many people playing on the board and tagging me and stuff, so it's just really good to see. And you can listen to the full coverage of the PDC World Darts final from Alexandra Palace from 7 o'clock tonight on Talk Sport. Right, well, moving on now. A row has broken out in a Wiltshire town over a rather controversial road name. Snowflake residents in Westbury are up in arms over two new signs for Slag Lane, which will be reinstalled five years after they were mysteriously taken down. The local council had previously rejected the road being renamed Lakeside View, arguing it's named after the slag piles from the town's old ironworks. Well, joining me is the independent councillor for the area, Westbury West, Matthew Dean. Matthew, thank you for joining me this evening. Explain um, the, the background to this story and what it was the residents wanted and what the council wanted. Well, I don't think there's a conflict, actually. Um, what, um, what, what the background really has been is that um, over 100 years ago, um, the council named uh, this road, which is a predominantly non-residential road, Slag Lane, after the slag uh, heaps that were that were made um, when the old ironworks closed. And uh, up till very, very recently, um, everyone's been happy with that. It, it, all it does is denote uh, the area and the history of the area. Um, and then um, recently, about 2014, uh, um, some new residents who moved into the area uh, suggested that, uh, that the road was uh, renamed. And uh, I think the balance of opinion is that most people think should, things should be kept as they, as they are. 
Um, slag, of course, might have some unfortunate connotations uh, for some people, but that's not, of course, uh, the meaning of, of, the, of this particular road, and that's why it was named. Well, that's right. I was also reading, uh, Matthew, that um, perhaps, according to some of the newspapers, that perhaps some of the residents thought that their houses would be worth more if the road was changed from what could be interpreted as a rather embarrassing name. Do you buy that? Uh, well, uh, no, I don't. In fact, uh, it's been put to be exactly the opposite. And that uh, actually, uh, actually, the last thing you want to do is if you've got a a very distinctive name for a, a piece of land that's been known for over a hundred years, um, the last thing you want to do is to change it around. I mean, I suppose if we're being kind, I can imagine, you know, if you're a teenage girl living on that road and you have to give your address and you say that you live on Slag Lane, I can imagine that there would be teasing and it might be embarrassing. That I totally get, but rather like you, I still don't think that's a good enough reason to change a historic name. Well, we seem to live in an incredibly woke, uh, politically correct times. And, uh, you know, my view is that, um, that people just need to uh, get a bit of a grip, really. Um, I think uh, if this is the biggest problem you've got in your life, uh, you're worrying about uh, your uh, the uh, road near you that that has almost no residential housing on it at all. Um, if you're worried about the name of that road, if that's the biggest problem in your life, then uh, then life is good. Well, rather like you were were saying, and I I know that the signs have been have been down for a bit, but sometimes in these places that have comedy names or you know embarrassing names or names that can be cropped like Scunthorpe to make something unfortunate out of them that actually you find that quite a lot of people travel to those areas to particularly in this social media age to take a silly selfie next to the the place name I wonder if that'll be the same for Slag Lane well Slag Lane is the main access road to an industrial estate so uh, I can't see it ever being uh, a sort of destination uh, of choice for uh, people wanting to uh, <laughs> live on a residential area. But uh, I, I think it's also something of nothing, really. And I did read in the one paper that they thought that the uh, signs had been down to uh, had been down to vandalism. And uh, we, we think, actually, that uh, the sign that came down uh, was hit by a bus, appropriately enough. <laughs> and uh, that's how it happened to, uh, happened to be removed. Well, I suppose from you know, for some areas, uh, the only thing worse than um, being talked about is not being talked about. So you've ended up on, I, mean, I don't know if you've seen it, you've ended up on the front page of the Daily uh, Star today, you know, your village. So I guess you've been well and truly put on the map. Well, um, we're a great little market town. We've got the biggest uh, white horse in Wiltshire. We're close to uh, Bath and Salisbury and... Uh, in many ways, we're a, an unremarkable town. Uh, we've, we've got a mix of sort of new and older housing. Uh, we've got a, a large industrial estate on the side of the town. If, uh, if this means that uh, people are a bit more interested in what goes on in Westbury, then that's all some good. Well, there you've got I think you've done a very good job of flagging up uh, all the reasons uh, why we should be uh, travelling or even moving uh, to Westbury, whether or not, as you said, Slag Lane is the address that everybody wants. But very appropriately, it's the road towards an industrial estate and it's named after uh, the industrial slag heaps that came from the ironworks. Uh, Councillor, thank you very much uh, for talking to us here on Talk TV this afternoon um, and congratulations uh, for not giving in to the snowflakes. Now, coming up after the break, female artists spent more time at the number one spot last year than any time in history. So are chart queens finally reigning supreme? I'm Daisy McAndrew. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. 
I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> yeah. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. This is Talk TV. Well, hello, welcome back. Now, it's been revealed that women dominated the music charts in 2023, with female artists spending more time at the number one spot than at any time in history. Miley Cyrus led the way with her post-breakup song, Flowers. That spent 10 weeks at the top of the charts. Dave and Central Sea's track Sprinter took second place while singer Ray secured third spot. Joining me live is music journalist Mark Webster. Mark, obviously, to me, this sounds like cause for celebration, um, but traditionally it's always been the case, hasn't it, that men just have dominated the music charts yeah. more than women. Totally right. And, and, and I think, Daisy, it's going to happen again. It's the, it's how the industry works. But the great news is, is that the 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 female, the women part, the women's part in in the whole pop music process has always been there, and it's never going to go away. And and this year has been a particularly strong one for what the Spice Girls would have called girl power, of course. Um, as you say, the charts are dominated. Uh, biggest selling album of the year was the Barbie soundtrack, which is littered with great female artists. You've got. Beyonce back on the road with the Renaissance tour and, and Dolly playing Glastonbury. So 2023 was a good year. It was a good year. So I remember being told that the reason men and you know boy bands and so on always did so much better uh, overall was that um, men like to listen to uh, male singers and women like to buy records and girls, particularly teenage girls, buy male singers because the men want to be the pop stars um, and the girls are sort of, you know, fancy the pop stars. Is that a thing of the past, no? That sort of wild generalisation as to why men sold more records than women? It's a really good question because... If you also look at the the information that's come out over the last year, is the way that records are being bought or music is being listened to has changed dramatically because 
there's no real rules about it anymore. It's not all about the chart singles, particularly. Downloads mean that there's no such thing as old anymore. V virtually everything can be contemporary because everything can be got at. I think one of the big deals is that in popular music, you'll have your big genre runs. You had rock and roll, you had punk, you had disco, uh, you had house music, you've got grime of most recent years. They tend to be dominated by male artists, certainly mm. initially, to kind of start the revolution. And that's backed up by a lot of the people that are in the industry as well to, to help that become a thing. But once it's settled down, this is when I think we reach a point where the music that that the, the, the ladies deliver, that is delivered by the writers, by the producers, by the musicians and by the artists, starts to hit pay dirt because what we have is a very melodious period. We've had extraordinarily good, catchy, accessible music come through of recent times. The next pop revolution is probably around the corner and it's probably going to make a lot of people cover their ears and say, what's this racket? But once that racket has been bought into by a new generation, it'll settle down and we'll, again, we'll have another strong influence of, of, of women within the music. All right. Now, I can imagine that I'll probably be one of those people covering my ears and saying, what is this, <laughs> what is this racket when my, my teenagers are playing whatever the next big thing is? But, Mark, what do you think the next big thing is? I could definitely see coming through another era. That, it's 50 years this year of, of disco and... Beyonce touched on that style um, with the Renaissance album and, and with her tour. And I think, again, this plays into the hands of the fact that so many of our great disco performers were the great divas of the scene. And I've got a funny feeling that good, old-fashioned, catchy disco, but perhaps with a slightly more contemporary beat, is going to have a real flourish in 2024. Well, I probably wouldn't wouldn't be covering be my okay ears. With that. I'd, I'd be okay. I'd be okay with that. Yeah, it's it's the sort of you know the grime um, and that type of thing yeah. that, I, that, that I can't I can't really stomach. Um, we can't talk about the power of the female pop star at the moment without talking about Taylor Swift. The, the way that she dominates now, and and not just you know, dominates the charts, which is what you and I are specifically are talking about but financially dominates, the way yeah. she's sort of taken control, you know, of that, the way that she can shift an economy wherever she goes. I mean, that has been a hell of a thing to watch. It's incredible how, how Taylor Swift worked her way up from becoming, from, from what was basically a popular country singer into, as you say, a world-dominated pop star, probably only second only, at, literally at this stage, to Beyonce. Um, and certainly perhaps on, on par, because what you might argue is, well, is the, what you can't ignore is the fact that Taylor Swift also happens to now run American football because yeah. her boyfriend plays for the Kansas City Chiefs and they're doing really well as well. And in fact, you barely see any football if you're watching American football because all you're seeing is Taylor Swift up in the box watching her boyfriend play. So as you say, she's all powerful at the moment and it, it's... She's not to my personal taste, and the reason I say that is that I don't find her to be the most potent of the female artists that are, that are out there at the moment, but yet you can see her appeal because she's so universal in the sense where she, she can appeal on a mass scale, and I say that based on the fact that clearly the numbers are there to prove it, and you, and you made that point yourself as well, Daisy. And I suppose it's worth mentioning people like Lizzo, who not only... It broke the mould of what a pop star should look like as far as many people were concerned. You know, we, we talk about the body positivity movement and some people disapprove and some people approve, but she's certainly, she's made a name for herself. Uh, you know, she's, she's obviously performed at Glastonbury and all the rest of it. She plays the flute. She's a really interesting character and she seems to, to merge different genres as well. She, she doesn't fit any sort of cliche, does she? Completely right. She's one of the great emerging stars of, of the last year and, and perhaps two. And as you say, simply by not being what she's expected to be, I think kind of going back to Taylor Swift, there's some, she, she's a self-manufactured perfect pop star. And Lizzo is basically defying all of the things that you would expect people to look like and sound like who are also sort of doing their business in that market. Strangely enough, my, 
my favourite track of the entire year was on the Mercury winning album by Esra Collective. And there's a song called Siesta and it's by Emily Sande. Or, or, or she's the featured vocalist. So, and, and she kind of comes and, and there she's singing on a jazz album. Yeah. And not only that, she's singing on a jazz album that has just won a Mercury Prize. So little, little battles are being won all over the place. It's an ongoing war to, for, for, for women to find their feet formally and firmly within the music business. But it feels like we're heading in the right direction, certainly after 2023. It does, it does. And Mark, obviously we're right at the beginning of 2024. Now you've already predicted that there'll be um, a sort of renaissance of some sort of you know, disco type pop music. What else do you think we're going to see this year? There's a big movement because the, there's an anniversary coming up of Two Tone and there's a new book out about it. The anniversary is here as well. I wouldn't be surprised if reggae also starts to make something of a comeback. Not like it ever went away, but I think the fact that... And you know, again, how these works, it's, it's a cyclic business, is popular music. If you think you say, well, that's old and that's been done before, well, I think you'll find that was 12 years ago, which means it hasn't been done before. It's being done again. And i got a sneaking suspicion that we'll also see reggae from some younger artists come through. It'll have a more contemporary twist, but I think it'll have that feeling about it as well. Basically, as I've been talking to you, Daisy, it occurs to me that I've gone for the old-fashioned adage, there's nothing new under the sun in, in music. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's fair enough. <laughs> but I guess one thing that has been new in the last few years, certainly in the last generation of pop stars, is how they make their money. You know, it, it, when, mm. when you and I were, were younger, it was all about it was all about being, you know, top of the pops. It was about, um, you know, breaking through into the charts, making money by selling records. Of course, since streaming, since Spotify, since, oh, yeah, all the rest of that, things have changed and it all became about the, the, the blockbuster live performance, the gigs, the merchandise and all that. Is that going to continue down the same vein? Yeah, definitely, because as you, as you point out so correctly, the, the old-fashioned way of making money by selling units, as the, as the industry likes to call it, as, it doesn't really exist anymore. So, therefore, artists... And, again, we go back to Taylor Swift on this one here and Beyonce. is owning yourself in the sense of you are a 360-degree business now. I am a person. Everything that's attached to me as me as this pop, pop artist person... I get to a piece of the pie. In the old days, it didn't always happen. And, so, and as you say, ticket sales and merchandise, are, it, they, they were always such a bugbear, with, with even the biggest stars. Madonna had terrible time with that in her, uh, in, uh, when she was at, at the peak of her fame. And, and, Mark, just explain to people who might not fully understand quite what a, a, a clever cookie Taylor Swift was when it came <laughs> to owning her own songs and, and how she felt she was being swindled and how she overcame that. Good business, good business partners. And also the fact that what also doesn't particularly happen anymore, and it can't, is that the major record companies, and they did become uber major over the last decade or more. We, we, we were more familiar with, with various different record label types that you would all know the names of. But if you, if, you look, if you look behind the Wizard of Oz curtain, it's about three companies that owned it all. So what's happened a little bit more now is that, that, you're, that these artists are going in there without having to basically sign their lives away mm. to these major companies, which also therefore means that the major companies are having to make a lot more concessions than they would have done. The theory would have gone, if you want to be a star, you're simply going to have to do as we tell you. Now, at least they're in a position where they can negotiate themselves into a better deal. Yeah, really, really interesting. Mark Webster, thank you so much for talking us through what's, um, what's up, what's down um, and how uh, the girls are doing it uh, for themselves as far as it <laughs> comes to uh, the charts. Mark Webster, thank you very much. Thank you. And, of course, just um, on that Taylor Swift thing, what she actually did was, because she didn't own the copyright to a lot of her own songs, she simply re-recorded them and re-released them to get around the fact she'd been swindled. Right, now, coming up after the break, less than two hours to go until teenage sensation Luke Littler battles it out for the World Championship Trophy. I'm Daisy McAndrew, you're with Talk on TV, Radio, Online and Smart Speaker.
Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you'll have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your this ideologies? This has been a party political broadcast ah, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm off calm. Just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? Use? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Hello, welcome back. Now, 16-year-old Darts Wonder Kid, Luke Littler, is on the cusp of making history. The teenager is just one win away from becoming the youngest darts world champion ever. The final kicks off in just under two hours from now, and he's been speaking to our colleagues over at Talk Sport. Let's have a little listen to what he had to say. It's been crazy. My Twitter slash X has followers gone up, the views have gone up. My Instagram have gone shot out the window and have even had messages off David Beckham, Romeo, Luke you, Shaw. You got a message from Bex? Yeah. Shock, zero. What did, <laughs> <laughs> what did Bex say? Was it a DM from Bex? Uh, I, don't, I think he said, well done, once a red, always a red. Amazing. And then Romeo's there tonight, he said, good luck. Oh, that's nice. That's it's nice. Crazy. Do you realise the effect you're having on people? Because we spoke about it off air when you weren't obviously here and I wasn't a big darts fan before yeah. this tournament but you've made me get into <laughs> darts like do you understand like, obviously the impact you're having yeah. on people and the sporting world it's unbelievable like even on Facebook Instagram and TikTok there's just so many people playing on the board and tagging me and stuff so it's just really good to see mm. well Luke prepared for tonight's final with a diet of pizzas and kebabs our correspondent Nick Ellaby has been down to his favorite takeaway in Warrington and sent this report Good afternoon, Daisy. If, and it's a big if, but if Luke Littler wins the PDC World Championship darts tonight, I'm sure there'll be a lot more trips to this place. We're outside Hotspot Kebab Shop in Warrington. This is, I have it on very good authority, Luke the Nuke Littler's favourite kebab shop. And, and the one he likes to celebrate with is the kebab wrap. So we're talking Donna meat, bit of salad, 
and mayonnaise as well. Not the usual garlic and chili sauce, but actually with mayonnaise. At this place, hotspot in the centre of Warrington, the kebabs are only four pounds. So if he does win, that half million pound jackpot can get him 125,000 kebabs. <laughs> he could have three a day for the next 100 years. So he will be well sorted. Uh, you know, we'll make light of it, but he, fast food is a, is a big part of Luke's preparation. We know that for breakfast every day at the Ali Pali before each match, he's having a ham and cheese omelette at home. And then he goes in, has a quick practice before enjoying a pizza at the Ali Pali before he goes on stage. And he's doing the same today, but it's the kebab he likes to celebrate with. But, you know, we've been in Warrington and St. Helens for the last couple of days, and, and he really is the talk of the town, Luke Littler, just 16 years old, an unbelievable talent, and, and the composure he's showing as well. If he can become world champion at the age of 16, it'll beat the record by eight years. And I think it really will be probably the biggest sports story since Leicester won the Premier League. And what do we know about Luke? Well, he's a pretty normal teenager. He likes to play FIFA, a video game. He likes to play a bit of darts and he likes his food as well. And his friends tell me he, likes, he quite likes sleeping. We know he has a French bulldog. Um, so we're kind of building up a bit of a better picture of, of who the man is. But, but, you know, this kid, I say man, he looks like a man, but he's still, he's still a boy, isn't he? Still a kid. He, he turns 17 at the end of this month, but um, everybody around here, Warrington, St. Helens, is rooting for him. And it's quite interesting because around here you've got a lot of different factions of rugby league teams. So, you know, you've got Warrington, St. Helens, Widnes. And what's happened is, is that Luke has united all these competitive clans. Uh, we were at a darts night last night, a, a league match between a pub called the Windle in St. Helens that uh, Luke has played for in the past and a local sports club, FC St. Helens. And everybody was just, you know, they were playing their matches, but they had one eye on the, the semi-final as well. And, and the word I keep hearing when I speak to people is unbelievable. It's unbelievable what he's managed to achieve at such a young age. And the way he's, he's also, he doesn't look 16. He's, he's playing the crowd. He's, he's using different techniques and incredible different checkouts as well. And, and making guys twice his age look, look silly, really. So, you know, should he win tonight, we know he'll be celebrating with a kebab down in London. And when he gets back to Warrington in the bosom of his, his family and friends, I'm sure he'll be uh, making his way down to Hotspot here in the High Street. Well, Nick, thank you very much. I can confidently predict that a Luke will win tonight because they're both called Luke. Sadly, we've come to the end of the show. Thank you for tuning in. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. People of Britain, do you fancy a good dose of common sense before bed? Because the Independent Republican Mike Graham is now in prime time. We still cover all the stories that matter and put the world to rights. We just do it a little bit later on. So don't miss the Independent Republican Mike Graham Monday to Thursday nights at 9pm, right after Piers Morgan Uncensored. Yes, the revolution will be televised. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. 
COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about.